Um, for just to, to start off then, uh, David, um, 11 months, I mean, wow, what have you been doing? It feels like about 22 months, <laughs> uh, yes. And, uh, it, well, it's been, um, um, I have to say, it's been much more challenging than I ever, ever expected. Until you, until you inside the industry don't really understand what it's like, it's incredibly operational. Yeah. It's an industry where it's no use being strategic, every day is tactical. Uh, and there's no use not understanding what's happening on the network and every single line all the time, because I can assure you there's someone out there that wants to know what's happening. So, but it's a fantastic industry, um, because so in this tiff, tough, tough times, how many under other industries can point to the level of growth we're experiencing, 5% across the, across the industry last year plus, and no sign of that um, declining in a, in a tough economic environment, and this huge support and level of investment, which so many other industries struggle for. Fantastic. What a, what a great place to start. Thank you so much. So let's take some questions from the floor then, please. Um, can I, if, if you'd like to put your hand in the air, and then I'll, we'll send the microphone to you. Uh, who'd, who'd like to go first, please? Look at that. Uh, there you are. We have to speak on the table, just here, please. The microphone's just on its way to you. If you could tell us who you are, sir, that would be, that'd be appreciated. Thank you. Casper Lucas, Transis Projects. Um, one thing that I would never have expected when I came into the industry in uh, 1997, which in some ways was an interesting time to come into the industry, was um, that we're now seeing um, work very much focused on what's going on on the rolling stock, and relatively minor modifications to rolling stock coming through from funds from Network Rail. Um, and this seems to be possibly something that will be resolved in future. Um, maybe not, I'm not sure. But it does seem a slightly odd way of, of managing a railway, um, considering that there ought to be an interface between, from, the, from network rail to the TOC to whoever is working on the trains. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering how you see that going forward, whether network rail has that um, ongoing interest in what some might say, I'm, I'm not saying that, but some might say is actually not necessarily it, it's, uh, its prime business. Okay. The other question, if I may, um, more, uh, more widespread, uh, we've mentioned a lot of investment projects. They all, apart from High Speed 2, appear to be in London and the South East. I'm almost tempted to wonder, from those of us who had to get up early and come down from other regions of the country, um, are we uh, in a position where it's actually possible to justify major investments outside the South East? Um, how does the industry look from that point of view? Well, let's answer the second question first. I mean, we've only recently, 2008, finished just under 10 billion put in the West Coast, which is a huge investment. We're talking about 35 billion for high speed two. So that, we've got electrification, Manchester, hub and uh, going to there, Liverpool, Blackpool, now across Trans Pennine. Uh, Northern Hub, another half billion pound project. Uh, huge investments at, at Birmingham New Street, another um, half billion going in there. So it is spread. Uh, but there is huge um, pressure on the commuter routes in and around London, which is the challenge which, let's face it, Crossrail and Thameslink should have been built a decade ago at least, at least, to cope with the possible demand. And, and not only the mainline rail, I mean, I was at London Bridge the other morning watching those trains going as dispatches every 40 seconds, and a new train has to get in and get out again on every single platform. I mean, the network's just holding together by a sin. As to the earlier comment, yes, it is a very, very fragmented industry, and that comes out in Sir Roy's report. We are fragmented, um, but we're doing everything we can to work closely with train operating companies and the Roscoe's to understand that um, rail wheel interface so we can look at the efficiency of maintenance, because it definitely affects our maintenance, uh, that, that issue. And I think that's just about it. people. Um, as much information, um, tech, the technical people um, work together to find out um, and as I look at the example on Southwest Trains recently, to get um, that, the maintenance uh, in the best way possible. So, that's it. Thanks so much. Okay, so um, some amazing thoughts there. Yeah, Tem Tempsing should have been built 10 years ago, indeed. I think I'm sure many people would agree with that uh, travelling in this morning. Okay, could we have a, we've got time for a few more questions. Uh, sir, microphone at Spain. So, Alistair Lenishner from Foster and Partners. Given that. Britain's already got one of the most intensely used railways in Europe, and that there's only so much you can do with the existing network. Shouldn't there be plans in the UK for looking 30 years ahead for a plan how you can actually cope with 
the doubling of uh, numbers you're talking about and actually looking at brand new railways above and beyond HS2, for example. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, if ever there's an industry that needs a 30 or 50 year plan, more than anything about technology, because we need to make a long term commitment on what forms of technology and are we going to use and what partners we want to invest in that. I couldn't agree more. Superb. Okay, and we've got time for one more question then, please, if there's uh, one more question in the room. No? Fine, good, okay. Well, David, thank you so much for that. I think that's given us a great insight, a great start to the morning, and uh, we'll look forward to the 30-year plan. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank